Well, look, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm going to have a, a look in the, the chat a little bit later when I give you a, a chance to do things. But it's lovely to see you all this evening. And um, also, I'm very uh, honoured to have people with so much experience that have come on the call. I think I might have something to add to their experience or to jog their memory of. Um, so please, let's let's make use of all your experiences as well, because there, there are many sides to what goes on in the call room. Um, what this is, these are some of the intended outcomes. I've just got to move you all over to the bottom of my screen. Um, so really, this is aimed very much at people who may not have very much experience of a call room, um, and particularly from the point of view of the coaches. So the very basic thing is understanding what the call room is used for and at which events you might find a call room operating. Um, and then, of course, there's lots of rules and timing and organisation that goes on. So we're going to look at all that and how we might introduce that to our athletes. And I think, you know, as coaches, we can be very good at doing the, the technical stuff and the tactical stuff. But actually preparing athletes for a competition, especially a competition where there might be a call room and it's the first time they've introduced it. That's actually quite a big piece of work as a coach to pass on. And it's quite a lot for an athlete to understand. Um, so uh, I'm not going to filter out or filter down the information. I'm going to give you all the information. And then you've got to think about your athletes and how much of that information they can cope with and what are the important things, perhaps the first time they, they go into a call room and how you can sort of layer that up as they get more experience. Um, so we're also going to look at the processes, the things that go in, on inside the call room and think a little bit about how an athlete can best use those to their advantage. That does stray into some stuff which is really about sort of psychology and you know how you want to feel. We're just going to brush on that a little bit because that really is, a, is another whole webinar or workshop. Um, and then, of course, we're also going to look at the rules that relate to the coaches and sports assistants, because um, you know, most of our events are, are individual events and we don't see coaches going in on the whole. We do see sports assistants going in, but not always getting the rules right. Um, but when you get to team and pairs matches, again, that's another big step and a big change for things that happen and things that you have to, to remember. So as I've said, this is very much aimed at those with less experience. Um, and one of the things I, I'm not going to do is enter into any conversations about something that happened in a call room to somebody you know at a previous event. Because I wasn't the head ref, I wasn't involved. So I can tell you what the rules state. I can tell you what I understand of things, um, but I won't be commenting if somebody else has interpreted it in a different way. That will be for you maybe to go back to them and, and talk to them about that or indeed to look at the rules. And all of the rules and processes we're going to look at are in BISFED folders and I'll give you the links to those right at the end. Um, so if you want to go and, and you know, uh, explore your way through that, you're very welcome to do that as well. So what is a call room? It, quite simply, it's a place where athletes gather to meet their opponents and officials prior to the start of the match. So this is a call room at an event we used to hold um, in this country, the Cheshire International. Um, and I think that might be a Welsh team um, and or it could be a Danish team. I'm just trying to decide who's playing there in red. And it's the Norwegian team on the other side. So they're obviously going to play on court seven. We can see that up on the wall beside them. Um, and the teams are in there with their coaches, with their sports assistant, and um, they're waiting for their referee to come along and introduce themselves. So it's just a place where we meet. And which events have call rooms? So I'm going to come to our uh, other UK representatives in a moment to, to help um, with this. Within England, uh, we have our Heathcote Cup, which is where we have players BC1 to BC8. Um, BC5, 6, 7 and 8 are classifications that we just have in this country. Uh, other people may have similar classifications. And 
probably the first time that many athletes will meet the quorum or need to go into one is at the Heathcote Cup finals. So it's potential, you could have somebody that comes into the sport quite new, perhaps next year, and if they make it to the finals, that's going to be quite a quick step up for them. Once a player gets into the BE Cup, the Botcher England Cup, which is by invitation, and that's really uh, players in the Paralympic pathway, the BC 1s, 2s, 3s and 4s, um, they're invited players and they will have qualified through what they've done in the past. Um, and we do have call rooms at the BE Cup rounds and finals. So any Botcher England Cup event, you'll usually find a call room. And then we have a national team and pairs events, which um, Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland have been invited to in the past and hopefully will be in again. Uh, that is just for BC ones to fours again, um, and you'll have call room there. So what you're not seeing there within Botcher England, I think, is the, uh, the league. League is pan disability, so it covers all the different Botcher classifications, and I don't think the league um, have a call room. Thanks, Dan, for shaking his head there. Um, and then anything that's uh, all the UK championships together, we have a call room there. And any BISFED events, or which is BISFED now called World Botcher, by the way, any of their events and the Paralympics will always have a call room. And that's where all the rules come from. So I wonder if I might just go to um, somebody from Scotland. Um, who have we got in the room from Scotland that can tell us about the Scottish system and where they might use a call room? Yeah, is Peter in, Peter Maguire? Yeah, I'm present. Oh, great, Peter. Can you tell me uh, when you use a, a call room in Scotland? Uh, we recently tried it uh, just once in the Scottish Open and championships, but prior to that, because of the size uh, nation we are, it hasn't been implemented. So most times we've had its UK champs or down to one of the tournaments down in England. Yeah. OK, thank you. And uh, Terry in Ireland, what are you doing there at the moment? Uh, so up to now, we haven't been running call rooms uh, at any competitions except at like, the UK championships. So it is something we're looking at introducing. So. I hope we don't scare you away today. No, nope, um, it's really good. And I think we've got Thomas from Wales. I know there's not a lot of botch going on at Wales at the moment. Have you used call rooms there before, Thomas? Um, I, I think we um, we were calling often, and we were doing a national one year. But um, I don't think we use calling many times in Wales. Thank you. It's a really good point. A call room often, um, you know, at a big international event, a call room is generally another complete room or it's completely separated with a, a pretty big solid wall from anybody else. But actually, at the initial events you go to, a quorum may just be one court in the corner of the, of the field of play um, where you gather and meet people and you only divide it perhaps by some benches or some chairs. So that's actually a really good point. Thanks, Thomas. Now, there's a bit at the bottom that says always check the event rules because they do change. So, and there's all sorts of things that can affect them. And indeed, having the space to have a quorum might be one having a, 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 um, a, a hall where you need to use all of the courts all of the time could be another one and so on. Um, so always check in the event rules if a quorum is going to be used it should be stated so you should know in advance that you've got to prepare your athletes to go into a quorum. Okay so when you arrive at the venue my suggestion is the first thing you do is you find the quorum and you ask which is the official clock. The official clock is usually going to be either on the desk at the entrance to the quorum, or it might be the main clock in that sports hall or in that room. It should be, it's certainly you should be able to see it from outside the quorum. 
And what you need to do is set your watch or your phone or whatever you're using for your timing. You need to set that to exactly the same time as the official, official clock, or if you prefer, fractionally faster. It definitely doesn't want to be slower. So just be aware that the call room clock is the one that you're going off of. You might then go into a sports hall to play and that clock might be different. At a major international event, all those clocks would be synchronized. So everywhere around, if you were in the warm up courts, you were in call room, you were on the field of play, you would be able to see the, the clock with the same time. But of course that doesn't happen at smaller events. So there'll be one clock that they're working from and that's the one that you need to work from as well. So if you do that when you first arrive at the venue, you can then start to plan the rest of the day and what time you're going to get to call room, etc. It also means you've found it, so there's no excuse for not arriving at the call room for your uh, match. Now, outside the call room, you might see a table that looks something like this. Um, so this is a table with some ball testing equipment on it. It's quite old um, because it's from Beijing in 2008. So the equipment has changed several times since then. And that's provided so that you can conduct your own tests on the balls that you've got with you. Um, so if you have one set of balls, don't worry about that. I wouldn't worry a player with this particularly, but actually if they're a developing player, they may have more than one set of balls or they may have some spares. And it's really good, particularly if it's a long time since you've checked uh, the weights and size and the, there's now a roll test for your balls. Um, if you haven't done that for quite a long time, you can test them, but actually, Things like the temperature or the moisture in the air can affect them as well. So it's quite good to practice. Uh, I'm not going to go into how we test balls, etc. today, um, I, but potentially next week uh, we're looking at officiating the core and that might be something that will be covered there. But I think it's a really good idea to ask referee, if you can find a referee when they're not busy, good luck with that, by the way, um, <laughs> then ask them to show you what the ball tests are. There is a protocol manual, which I'll give you details for at the end. And um, in that, it tells referees how to conduct the ball test. So for your more experienced athletes, you should be expecting them to know how the ball test is conducted so that they watch what happens and they make sure that the referees conduct the test in the right way. Because if the referee doesn't conduct it in the right way and your ball fails, you've got grounds to appeal and ask them to do it the right way again. But if they've done it the right way and you've seen that and your ball fails, well, you'll know that for that competition, you won't be able to use that ball. Okay. Um, is there anybody that wants to add anything to that who's had um, ball tests and what's your experience of using the ball test equipment that's set up outside? Do you find it useful? Lauren just popped in the chat, Sandra, that she thinks there's some um, useful videos on the BizFed website as well to, to show testing procedures. So that might be worth a look for people. Oh, that's lovely. Yes, thank you. And you can still find that if you type in BISFED, even though they've changed to World Botcher, it still comes out as a Google search. Um, so what we're going to do now, we're going to work out when the call room is going to open and close for your players' first match. So this is where we're going to use some of your supporting paperwork that was sent around earlier today. So if you have it, You've got something which has got um, a bit of a, a grid on the front of it. Uh, well, it's only one piece of paper that was sent with your name or class of somebody at the top and then some timings, which we're going to pop in. If you haven't got that, don't worry. Paper and a pen is fine. Um, and you can look at this later. So in an, if a match is scheduled to start at 10 o'clock and it's an individual match, the call room will open 30 minutes before the scheduled start of the match and it will close 15 minutes before the scheduled start of the match. So what I'd like you to do now is write in the top in your for your first match here 
this is something that I prepare and like to give out to athletes. So I've often give them a simplified card with this information on, and it'll just, we work backwards so that they can work out when to, they want to get to quorum and make sure they don't miss it. So almost the first thing you're going to put in is that the line that's in bold that says first match. Um, so we can make up a name, you can have anybody you like in there versus somebody on court, whatever. We need, we, having the court number is really helpful. And the time is going to be 10 a.m. So if you haven't done this before, if you can write that in that the first match is going to be, let's say on court two at 10 a.m. Now, if you come back above that line and you look on my slide here, the call room closes 15 minutes before that. So just like you to work out what 15 minutes before 10 o'clock is, that's what you're gonna put in onto that line. Now, remember this might sound really, really easy for us to do, and I don't want to undermine any of your abilities to tell the time. But actually for some of our athletes, it is much harder. So if we can help them with this, that's great. And obviously some athletes will get to a point where they shouldn't need help with it and they should be responsible for it themselves. That's mm. something as coaches as well. We start by telling, we go on to helping and pointing out, and then eventually the athlete will take ownership and they'd be able to do this for themselves. So we look at the line above when the call room closes, it asks us when the call room opens, and we can see that it opens 30 minutes before. And we're gonna move on to another slide to work out actually when they might want to start their pre-match preparations and what that might look like. Okay, so hopefully now you've got written down that the call room opens at 9.30, that the door closes at 9.45, and that's for the match at, on court two at 10 a.m. So we'd like to go down to the second match and now do the same, but do it for pairs or team. So it doesn't matter whether this is a BC3 pair, BC4 pair, or a BC1 and two team. With teams, the timing's slightly different. The call room opens 45 minutes before and it shuts 20 minutes before. This time it's just going to make the maths a little bit harder for you. The second match is going to be on court four at 2.30 p.m. So if you'd just like to have a little look at that to see for a team or pairs match what time you think the call room will open and close. So I have you all got enough fingers? <laughs> yeah, so the call room will open at 1.45. That's 45 minutes before. And it will close at 10 past two. Okay, so this is really important because if a player has only been used to the call room, uh, and individuals and they think getting there 15 minutes before is going to be fine and they arrive 18 minutes before for a team match they're not going to be playing okay any issues so far I can promise you it's not all as hard as this yeah that's that's the nasty maths bit out of the way but it is actually one of the most important things because you won't be allowed in after the call room closes. Okay, this is the biggest thing to get across. Once that door is shut, you don't get in. Now, however, there are some exceptions. So if we think from the bottom of the pathway up, then the place where as an organization, you're going to first introduce a call room so maybe in Northern Ireland, the first time you have an event with a call room, often we'll use what we call advisory rules, which means that we haven't had a call room before or we recognise that the athletes here may not have used a call room before. So we're going to allow them to make a mistake. 
So if they turn up 10 minutes before the match and the quorum door is shut, we don't want to send them away without playing a match. They've made a mistake. What we'd like to do is explain it to them, make sure they know what time they've got to be there the next time round and allow them into the quorum and allow them to play their match. So this is a bit about local rules, isn't it? So this, because this is an exception, this should be put into the rules of the event. So you would see, we're going to have a um, quorum for the first time. We're going to apply all the rules. You'll be allowed to make one mistake. <laughs> okay. And then the rest is up to coaches to really make sure they've assisted their athletes and they know what they're doing. I can remember the first time I was a technical delegate at the European Championships, we had two new countries. The last thing I wanted was for a country to miss the quorum. So I kept my beady little eyes on them on the first day that we were open and just sort of reminded them, don't miss the quorum. And we would have something outside the quorum, a sign up, which actually said, quorum opens for the next round at this time, quorum closes for the next round at this time. And we would just keep changing that as the day went through so that everybody could come and, and make sure they'd got their times right. So there's another possibility. For whatever reason, the quorum door may have been shut before it should have because something is happening and they don't they can't process any more athletes at the moment. If you're in a queue outside the quorum before closing time and it's the quorum manager that stopped you from going in, you will be admitted. They will come and take a, a note of you know who's in the queue. So if they know that, you know, Dan Bentley is the last person in the queue to be there before the time, OK, everybody down to Dan Bentley is going to get in. They'll probably take a list of your names, numbers, whatever. Um, this is it's a very rare occurrence. Mm. And if it did occur, probably a referee or um, somebody like that would be actually be outside be kind of guarding the back of the queue we'd be there behind Dan saying no sorry you've arrived too late the guys in front were here on time they're going in um, as I say very very unlikely to happen but I know people do worry if that sort of thing happens if you're definitely there beforehand and you haven't been allowed in for whatever reason you will be allowed in and then the other thing that a lot of players really worry about, and this particularly happens when you get to the sort of knockout stages, so quarterfinals, semifinals, going into final. Um, from a competition manager's point of view, you very often have to get players off court and back onto court really, really quickly. So um, if you're, you, you might have gone to your second tie break in your very long team match, and you know that actually, um, if you win, you've got, you should have been in the quorum 10 minutes ago. You must not be worrying about the quorum. You must keep your focus on the match you're playing. So what you need to know, if you can see you've got two matches back to back, you need to make sure the athlete knows when they go on, don't worry about the quorum, that will be organised for you. So you might still be on court, but the head referee would know that you were on court. They'd make sure the quorum manager knew you were on court. And probably there'll be a referee waiting to meet you the minute your match is finished and then to make arrangements for you to go to the quorum in an appropriate time. Now, at a minimum, you would usually be given probably um, up to 10 minutes to... Uh, go and do any routines you need. So if you need the bathroom, for instance, um, you may be accompanied by a referee, not into the bathroom, of course, but to the bathroom, etc. So, but actually you should have a moment to, if you need to rehydrate, you need to eat something, um, you need to you know, change something, whatever, you should have be allowed that time. Um, and you might be given a new time. So, okay, you've come off, court at two o'clock um, I would like you to be in the call room by 10 past two and then that becomes your new time but the I'm not writing all this down for you because the important thing is don't worry the head referee will sort you out okay uh, again is there anybody that's experienced that and and found that it it works 
maybe Peter? Yeah, uh, loads of times. As yeah. a player on court, you just, as you said, focus on what's in front of you and let the organisers worry about the schedule and that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Just tell you. As a team, it's been tight. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, um, um it, if it happens, what we did is whoever didn't need the toilet, normally me, that would send me to your death. And why but in a team, do not go in on your own. No, we're going to get to that bit as well. Thank you. But that's that's really important. So actually, you discuss as a team what might happen if you have a short time in between. Yeah. I think as coaches, if it's somebody who's new to call rooms, just I think the message is don't worry, the referees will make sure you get to your next match. Just co concentrate on the match you're doing. And when you come off court, we'll let you know what's happening. OK, that's a really important thing. As your player gains more experience, you as a coach will probably gain more experience as well. And so then, you know, they might want to know, well, how are they going to make it OK? Well, that's how you, how it works, basically, is that the, the head referee will make sure there are some alternative procedures put in place for you. OK. So there's quite a lot of things that happen before you go into the call room. Uh, and I put a list of them on your paperwork. So if you go down to the bottom of the first page, um, these are some of the things that you might want to do before you go to the call room. So I guess a lot of us know athletes who like to turn up at 10 past nine, ready for a match at 20 past nine, and they don't warm up, they don't do anything else. But actually, I hope that a lot of you have had the opportunity to see athletes that are experienced athletes who know what they're doing, and they will have a complete pre-call room schedule that they've worked out. So it's very much something you've got to do with an individual athlete. Um, and these are some of the things to think about. When does the athlete want to go to the call room? So I know athletes who, if a call room door opens at uh, 2.15, they'll be there at 2.15 or before. They want to go in the minute that door opens. I know athletes that are very happy to go in at 2.25, five minutes before the door shuts. They know they can get there. They've practiced it lots of times and that's what they like. And it's entirely up to your athletes what they want to do. So that's the first discussion to have with them is actually what time do you want to go into the call room? It's got to be between the doors opening and the door shutting. OK. Um, and then there's a number of things that most athletes will at least think about. So we've got here the warm up. So how long does your warm up take? When do you start? So again, experienced athletes will have kind of a set warm up. It's not set in stone, but they, they know the processes they go through. Um, they'll also probably have a slightly shorter warm up that they can do. So maybe for the first match, I'll do a longer warm up for the second match, I'll do a shorter one, but that's something that develops with experience. As far as new athletes are concerned, we just really want to make sure that they're safe and they've had a bit of a stretch and they're nice and safe and they're ready to go on to court. So don't know how long you're going to be on court for, if it's a BC3 match, using the bathroom might be essential. If it's a BC4 match, it might be just a little bonus because we're not going to be there long anyway. But that's something you think about because you don't want to end up needing to use the bathroom either when you're in the call room or when you're out on the court. 
So what about eating and drinking something? What are your nutritional needs and hydration needs? And by the way, you can eat and drink in the cool room. And I don't mean a three course meal, you know, nice hot stew and a followed by a sticky toffee pudding. Um, but actually, if you've got a piece of fruit or a um, nutritional bar or something like that, that you want, that's absolutely fine. Um, you probably are taking drink on court with you anyway. But, so you can do those things in the cool room. Uh, you may, of course, need medication. Um, you'll know about that. Uh, I will mention the um, world anti-doping code, but uh, that's only something, again, that our top level athletes really need to be looking at. This is quite a key one, I think, sometimes. You know, when you're at, you, the first time you have a call room might be when you're at a national finals. If it's the Heathcote Cup finals, then you might have a whole entourage of people that are coming to wish you well. So is there a point at which you want to say goodbye to them because actually they're just getting in the way? So it could be that before you do your warm up, you want to get rid of, rid of them. Or it could be that actually that you'd love them just to come and say good luck just before you go in the call room. So, you know, you kind of start to get the athlete to think about how they want to manage that and whether it's helpful to have their friends and family all around them while they're warming up and getting ready or whether it's helpful to ask them to to go away and be somewhere else and then is there a point when you start to feel match ready and that's that's different for lots of people for some people might want to go into their kind of match bubble there you know right i'm now sandra the botcher athlete um, they might want to do that quite early on when they go to their warm up. Some people don't want to do that until they're given the jack ball on court almost and everything in between. So what I thought it would be good to do now is to maybe um, have a look. We're going to put you into some groups of people that uh, you might know. And bet between you, I wonder if you can think of um, an athlete that you might all know. Um, and if not, kind of invent one, kind of say, OK, let's imagine we've got a BC2 athlete who's just started and doesn't do much warm up. And I want you to think what are these things they might want to do and how they what sort of order they might want to do it in. So we're going to give you about five minutes to discuss that. So if we come back at about 740. Um, and I think my beautiful assistant, Natalie, will have arranged some groups for you. Yeah, ready to go. So you're going to get an invite come up on the screen. If you'd accept the invite, um, I'm just going to admit Jill Savage back and Lee. Um, if you accept the invite, go into those groups um, and have a discussion based on those things at the bottom of your paperwork um, about what sort of order people might want and what they might want to do. OK, thank you. Excellent. Well, I hope those were some good discussions. It would be really good to get some um, feedback from you. And remember that each of you is was thinking about a different athlete. So there are no right answers to this. The, the, uh, the right answer is the one that suits your athlete the best. Um, so were the gr groups numbered or lettered or? Um, well, I'll pick someone if you like. Shall we go, <laughs> um, shall we go Bob's group first? Why did I guess that was going to happen? Well, I, I could actually possibly tell everybody we might be asking, is it Lauren and Pete and somebody else as well? And Dan? Was it? T Terry too. There you go. Oh, Terry, there you go. We might be asking them as well. Thank you. <laughs> well, the, the one thing, I mean, five minutes is not really very long by the time we'd all said hello and, and, <laughs> and all that bit. The one thing uh, that Lee Madison throw into the, the ring that, that isn't on there is to get a copy of the match schedule for the day. Because we then expanded that into, you know, if you've got a match at 9.30 and then another one at 12, you've got a considerable break between matches to actually, you know, eat or drink, um, to do all the all the necessaries whereas if you've got a match that finishes at 12 30 12 40 and your next one's at half one and you've got a factoring call-up room it doesn't leave you much time so lee That's a really good point well. actually 
And um, yeah, well done, Lee. I mean, I think I've really been concentrating on the call room bit for this. So you're quite right that the rest of that preparation is equally as important. And so what I guess I was maybe asking you to look at what would be ideal. So, you know, your ideal preparation going in might be an hour before you go into the call room. But actually, if you've only got 20 minutes, then what do you prioritise and how do you do that? So really good point. Thank you. And the other thing that Mark threw in, Mark Hoyle, was get rid of fans and f friends and family first. Get, get rid of them as soon as you can. Get them upstairs, out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. I'm not hearing you very loudly, um, Lee, so I'm not, didn't catch that, I'm sorry. Lauren, can you help? It, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it depends on who you've got helping you. Yes. Yeah. Is that right, Lee? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, as we, we said, Lee's friends and family are his team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And again, it's, it's about what's right for each individual. And you might have um, an athlete who's a BC8 with a learning disability who may actually need friends and family with them a lot more and so on. We Shall also we on used, to... Alf... sorry, we used, we used Alfie Yates as an example because he used to have one of the biggest family entourages I ever saw. <laughs> Excellent. Grandparents, parents, friend, fat uncles, aunts. So, but anyway, sorry, move on, Sandra, sorry. No, no, not at all. We've got plenty of time. So uh, who's, who is group two, Natalie? Uh, Lauren next. Lauren, Andy, Emma and Roy. Yeah, so we chose an athlete and kind of stopped talking about the athlete quite quickly and spoke about the scenarios as individual scenarios, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. um, and then we kind of, we said Jabe because he was a common person. And we were like, we're, you know the answers to these, so that's going to put pressure on us getting it right. So we kind of fed away from that. Um, but kind of similar conversations um emma made a really good point sort of from an athlete's perspective um and sort of said that eating and drinking is something that can happen in the call room you're always going to have a water bottle with you so that might not be something that you prioritize straight away whereas obviously using the bathroom once you're in the call room you're kind of stuck there yeah. um so you so that would probably be the thing to do and like lee emma said you you know, she doesn't really say goodbye to friends and family because her mum follows her into the call room as her sport <laughs> assistant. Um, so, again, kind of having the boundaries, I guess, with that um, and knowing who's where and when. Um, again, we said about a warm up, how if you can't do a full warm up on a court or there are no warm up courts available, then maybe utilising um, therabands and how you can do some sort of stuff in in the call room as well so you can still get that range of movement um and just get your muscles working a little bit even if you can really interesting throw proper balls uh we're going to have a look at what you might take into the call room with you so therabands is one is one of those things that you might want to take in with you yeah i think that's pretty much where we got to i think unless any of the others want to chip in um no emma's happy Thank you. And group three? I can't see Andy. Shall we go uh, Pete's group now? Okay, I'll, well, I'll do the talk for our group. Um, we sort of, we agreed with everything you've been saying, so there's not much point in repeating um, <laughs> what, what you were all going. But then we also talked about what you would bring into the call room, or more importantly, what you wouldn't bring in. Because remember, ah. what you bring in, you have to bring back out again. Save that thought, because that's okay. where we're going next. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, and I think we had a fourth group as well, didn't we? Yeah, Terry's group next. Does that mean I'm, I'm speaking or does anybody else want to? <laughs> uh, no, no. Well, to be honest, we didn't really get as far as discussing a player. We discussed a bit of, there's a bit of a mix of experience with call rooms. So we sort of discussed a few things. And I suppose one thing we'd thought of was if there's a technical issue in the call room so say somebody's chair or a ramp or something breaks what way does that affect things or i think that was the only thing nobody else mentioned so 
No, thank you. Uh, and that's an, another good point that we're probably going to come to. I'm just desperately reaching for a pen because I've picked two up that don't work. That works. That's good better. Thank you. I'm just making a note to give you longer in your groups the next time round. So guess what? It's the first time I've done this as a webinar. So <laughs> I have to learn things. But thank you so much for that. I think, you know, what you've said is really important. All of those things are important in your day. Um, and um, you've got to work them out with your athletes. So if you've got, you know, a, a stable of athletes, if you've got a whole load of people from your club or your um, academy or your country that are playing, actually each of those might have a completely different day and different timings. Um, if you're a team manager, you need to know all those timings. So if you know, need to know that, you know, player A is not so good at getting to the call room, you've got to prioritise making sure they are in the call room for their matches and supporting them with that. Uh, and if, but if you know player B is a so-and-so for not eating, that's the thing you've got to work with them. Actually, you might be busy, but you've got to eat sometime. When, when's that going to happen? So thinking from a coach's point of view as well if you've got one athlete it's great you can help them with this all through the day if you've got a whole load of athletes somebody else is going to have to help them or they're going to have to take charge of that themselves and obviously we work with some athletes that can do one and some athletes that need the other um, so that's another thing is how do we help an athlete to, to get all these timings etc um, so if you Look, actually, what we might do, um, Natalie, we might put people back in the groups they were in a minute ago. Am I being really naughty there? Have you already got groups ready for next time? No, that's thought, fine. That's fine. On the next page, uh, at the top of the second page on your paperwork, is actually the little chart for you to sort of fill in. So what I'd like you to do now is go and actually be specific about and it, this is a what it might be for an athlete and Lauren I'm going to say you can use Jabe it's fine because I worked with him two years ago and it will be absolutely reasonable to expect that this has changed in that time and he does something quite different so there's no right or wrong again but let's see if we can get you to actually specify for one athlete what they might be doing in the run-up what those timings might look like so um, when you go into the groups Let's get somebody different to feedback this time, okay? But you guys have just done it. Thank you so much. Perhaps you could help them to, to sort of move that on. So shall we go back for, uh, we'll give you seven minutes this time as it's, as, as it's an extra. Thanks very much. So welcome back everybody. I'll be we're looking like we've got lots now back in Natalie. Yep, that's everybody. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. I hope that gave you a bit more opportunity to have a, a you know, better and fuller discussion. I'm actually not going to ask for feedback because I want to have some other discussions later. Um, but I hope that really just gives you the, the start of that conversation that you can have with other coaches and with between coaches and athletes about what they need to do, what they want to do, how they're going to fit things into their programme and how that means then they're not going to miss the call room, which is really the point of this. So, yes, we could do more training on how we organise everything else, but this is about the call room. The next thing I want you to know is who can go in. So when you go to the call room, you have to go with everybody you're taking with you at the same time. So if you notice in the individual matches, um, and these only show BC1 to BC4 because that's the Paralympic pathway, but if you have a quorum for fives to eights, then we, we, they would be the same as a BC4. I, I think it would usually be done in the same way. So each individual athlete can have a coach. Now, at most of the um, big matches in this country, uh, internally, we very, very often would not have a coach that goes in. If it's helpful for an athlete to be supported by somebody in the call room, they could have a coach go in. But my, it, and actually, you might not have a coach for every single athlete you've got. So it might actually be that it's mum or it's dad or it's a friend or it's another athlete or whatever. As long as you call them coach, they can go in. 
Internationally, it's a bit different because we have accreditation that says we're a coach. Um, so which would be an interesting one. You'll also see that there are three classes there that could have a sport assistant with them. So a BC1 has a sport assistant, a BC3, and we've not seen one in this country yet or in the UK, I don't think. But if we have a BC4 who is a foot player, they can have an assistant. So that's just something to note because there will be a time when we get a foot player in the BC4 class if your athlete is a BC4 and you go in and you meet your opponent and they've got an assistant with them, you're going to think that's wrong unless you know that they can have a sports assistant if they're a foot player. So again, that's just something a little bit of awareness. And when we get to the pairs and teams, you'll see you can only have one sport assistant per athlete in pairs BC3. Uh, and I guess in pairs BC4, if you had two foot players, that would be very interesting. I think they probably have to share a sports assistant because in the team, um, even if you have a team of five BC1 players, you can only have one sports assistant. So those players would have to share that sports assistant. OK, so this is the maximum number of people who can go into the call room. So if you're going in with a team, you could have up to five players with one coach and one sports assistant. And all seven of you have to go into the call room at the same time. Now, it's one of Sandra's little pet hates is when the team decides they're going to meet at the call room desk. Because you can imagine there might be eight teams or even 16 teams playing at the same time. And if all of those 16 teams have seven people going in the call room and they all decide to meet outside the call room door, mayhem ensues. So my suggestion is if you're organising a team to go into a call room, you meet somewhere else. And you meet somewhere else five minutes before you want to get to the call room door and then you go when everybody's together. Now, hands up here because I have been at a European Championships as a coach to a BC3 pair that were playing for England. Uh, there were three players in the pair, which is what's allowed. And one of them had turned up to the call room without a very key part of their ramp, something we used to use, we don't see as much now, it's called a D-ring. It used to fit at the top of the ramp and used to put the ball on the top of the D-ring. And we actually waited outside the call room while the assistant, had to run around the sports hall trying to find this D-ring. And we knew that if they didn't get back in time, we were going in with two athletes in our pair instead of three, because there was no point in the athlete going in without the D-ring because they couldn't play without it. So when we talk about, and some of you started talking about equipment, that's how good you've got to be at knowing what equipment is needed and knowing what to go in. And that is what you would do if you didn't have everybody and everything before you went in. So good practice would be that you're outside, that you do a check about who you've got, what you've got. Have you got absolutely everything you need? Right, we're going in. OK, if an athlete turns up, they haven't got what they need and they're not going to get back in time. You're going in without them and you're going in to play with less people than maybe you wanted to. So really, really important. This is all very clearly laid out in the rule book, by the way. This is nice and easy to access. So equipment. There's a couple of things you need to know. So firstly, with individuals, you must not take more than 13 balls into the call room. Now, there are some bags or boxes of balls that hold more than 13 balls. So there's more than 13 little scoops out holes in them. And if you are used to filling all the holes up because you've got extra balls, it's very easy to go into the call room with too many balls. And if you do that, you'll get a yellow card, okay? But if we just flip over to the teams and pairs, remembering that you can have 
up to three players in a pair and up to five players in a team, you can only have one jack ball between all of you. And if you're in a team, each player can have two red and two blue balls. And if you're in a pair, each player can have three red and three blue balls. If you have more balls than that, you'll get a yellow card. So you really need to work out how you're going to take the right number of balls in if you're in a team. And it's one of those things, again, it's so easy for a player to go, yeah, I've got my two reds and my two blues on my lap. I'm ready to go. And then haven't realised that their assistants left the rest of the red and ball, blue balls on the back of their chair. OK, so it's really, really one to be considered. Um, I've just put a little thing in there about what you take in. At international matches, we give courtesy gifts. So we might give a little England flag or a... I don't know. We've had all sorts of funny things in the past. I remember when we went to the Czech Republic once, um, Dan Bentley will remember being given a yo-yo, which is quite difficult for most of our athletes to use. <laughs> um, but going back onto the, the left-hand side of the page, everything the player takes into the call room will end up in the playing box with them, except the other colour balls. So if they are going to be red, the blue balls don't stay in the box with them. OK, so my question is, do they need that bag on the back of the chair? And what is really helpful to have on court with them? Um, and I've also made a little note about extras. So, for instance, that person that didn't have their D-ring with them. Well, actually, if it's that essential, do you need a spare? If that breaks during the match, what are you going to do if you can't play without it? So actually, that's OK but you've got to find somewhere to put it with you. And in days gone past, we used to have people that would take two or even three ramps in with them. Nowadays, the ramp, one ramp does everything you need it to do. But uh, a long time ago, when people played with gutters and drain pipes, they would have different lengths of gutter and drain pipe, and they would be attached on the back of their chair or something. So what I thought we'd do, um, Mark calls this popcorn style, so you can unmute yourselves. I thought we would just kind of quickly shout out a few things that you've seen a player taking on court that they don't need. And then we'll think about some things that you actually do need. So this could be mayhem because we've got lots of people on the call, which is lovely. But if you'd like to unmute, can you tell me some things you've seen on court that you think a player doesn't need with them? A bag on the back of the chair. A bag on the back of the chair. That's the top of my list as well, Emma. A handbag. A handbag, yes. Obviously, a handbag might have a sense of navigation in it, but <laughs> yeah. A blanket. A blanket. Yes, because a blanket might fall off in the on the court and go outside the box and cause all sorts of problems. Cuddly toy. <laughs> Cuddly toys, yes, indeed. <laughs> but actually, we say that, but I, we have some players who have assistance dogs. Yeah, so we actually might have a cuddly toy with them for the <laughs> assistance dog. Uh, coats. Coats, yes. If they might wear the coats in the quorum or on the court, fine. If they're clearly not going to wear it, their wheelchair is not a coat stand. Mobile phone that's not been turned off. Oh, a mobile phone. We're going to get to mobile phones, but you're quite right. Yeah. You shouldn't have a mobile phone that you're going to use for communication. Even if it's switched off? Um, yeah, well, if it's switched off and you're not going to use it, you don't need to take it with you. <laughs> you might want to protect it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> What, what is the music, music in the room? Yeah, coming to that on a slide in a minute. Coming to a slide near you. Okay, so let's switch. Let's think of things that players need to take or may need to take on court with them. What have you what? seen players use on court? Balls. Balls. Ramps. Ramps. A drink. a drink. 
sports assistant. A sports assistant. Dan Wayne. Uh, can we just hold it for a moment? Somebody was using a communication aid. Could you repeat, please? I think I might have missed somebody there. Um, and by the way, if anybody wants to put anything into the chat as well, I think Natalie will keep an eye on the chat for us. So I'm sorry if I missed somebody. Um, how about a towel? Yeah, I, I take a uncle. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a lot of our players that get quite sweaty. <laughs> drinks well. bottle. Drinks bottle, yeah. Well, would you be able to take a, like, a little um, flannel? Yes. Some people use a flannel instead of a towel. Some people, especially if it's a very hot day, will have a flannel in a little pot or a bag or something that's actually damp to keep them cool. Right. In the... I have little bit of I'm sorry, you have a little something to put something on. Oh, excellent. So you attach it to your belt so it doesn't go on the floor. Um, I heard somebody saying calibration sheets. So look, there's lots of things that you might need and you really need to think about that. And particularly, what are the things that you couldn't play without? You know, balls. your balls, your balls, balls. However, if you go into the call room without your botcha balls, you will be offered some botcha balls and you'll be able to use the ones that are provided by the um, competition. So what can you do? Well, in the call room, you can eat, you can drink, you can chat, you can listen to music and podcasts. OK. So you may well want to take something into the call room with you to listen to your music and podcasts on. And that might be your mobile phone. Yeah. But what can't you do? Well, you can't use your phone as a phone. So usually we would ask that phones were put onto flight mode. And that means that we know that you can't use it to contact somebody. So you yeah. can't be sitting in the call room talking to your coach who's outside the call room. OK. But of course, your phone these days can be used for all sorts of other uses. You might use it to help you with your communication. You might use it to listen to music or podcasts and things. So the other thing you can't do when you're in the call room is leave and return. If you leave the call room, you can't come back in. So if you're a BC3 and your sports assistant leaves, to call, leaves the call room because they forgot to go to the bathroom, they can't come back in and you won't be able to play because you won't have a sports assistant. So you've got to remember that these rules apply to everybody. It's not, they don't just apply to the athletes, they apply to everybody that's going to be on court. And something else that uh, doesn't happen generally internationally, although we know that from time to time it's been tried, but might easily happen um, in a call room where it's on, we're only divided by a movable board or a um, set of chairs or something, that you shouldn't ask anybody to pass something to you from outside the call room. So you have to take everything in with you that you need. You can't then leave again until you go out into court or you can't leave and come back in again and you can't ask you can't go oh i've forgotten my d-ring i need you to go back could somebody get them for me okay so generally you'd be in a separate room at a big big competition and that that would be an impossibility so essential items probably come under some of these um headings here um you don't need day bags and handbags and clothes you won't be wearing, but you might need any of those things there. Hydration, nutrition, medication, towel, music, earphones, chair spares, straps and ties. Um, we said therabands earlier, didn't we? Botcher equipment, ramps, spare parts, pointers, the assistant stall. In fact, what can't you manage without? So 
that's where as a coach you need to help your athletes to be able to make this list and to know exactly what it is that they need what they can't do without and how they would manage if there was anything that was really hard for them um so ball trays things like that we haven't put on here either so what happens when you go in well you report to the desk outside the call room you have everything together um, and have everything sorry and everyone together when they go in and like we spoke about the team earlier uh, mostly you'll just say the your name and the court number you're playing on so going back to that card we were preparing earlier do you remember it said oh emma you're going to be playing against lee uh, at uh, on court three at 10 o'clock so you just go in and say, well, I'm Emma Harris and I'm on court three. And that just makes it really easy for the call room manager to take you to the right place in the call room or to point out where it is. If you don't know your court number, it just makes it a little bit harder for the call room manager. Hopefully you will know your name and you can state your name. Or if it's difficult for them to somebody to understand you, you might have it on a, on a card or something. Sometimes we have accreditations we use. At big international events, we would all have an accreditation which would show our name. Uh, we would all have numbers attached to us. That's both the athletes and the sports assistants would have numbers. And you would not be allowed into the quorum if you didn't have your accreditation or your numbers. You have to have both. Um, so again, that's sometimes been a bit difficult. It's a really hard one. Um, if you've got somebody there, you really don't want to keep them out of the call room for something like not having the appropriate numbers, but it is their responsibility. So when you get inside, you'll be taken to an area that's set out for your court. So usually there'll be the, the court number. So in this case, it's number nine. And there's often a group of um, chairs or benches or something for that area and you'll go in there you'll meet your opponent there and you'll meet your match officials there so you go in and you wait and what might happen is you might have a random equipment test so yes that is a grapefruit on top of the uh, scales there and uh, it just ask cassandra turk about grapefruits and sandra in beijing and she'll tell you the delightful story not time for it now. <laughs> but what it's indicating is that your botcher balls may get tested. So they get tested for their weight, their size and the roll test. And if any of them fail, you'll be offered a competition ball as a replacement. So um, if they do fail, um, you, uh, the athlete will get a yellow card as well, which is important to know. Um, Different places do different things. Most recently, they've been given balls back and it's up to you to decide whether you're going to try taking it into the call room again next time. But obviously, if you risk that and you get a second yellow card, that becomes a red card and you don't get to play. Um, now, all, everything else will have been checked already. So things like the height of chairs, the size of ramps um, and head pointers and things, the legality of them, they usually have stickers on and the referees will usually just ask to look at them. So you'll often see people just sort of moving their chair around and pointing to where the sticker is that said, yeah, this, this chair is acceptable or whatever. That will be done at an equipment check that happens um, before the competition starts. Yeah. Can I just say something? Yes. You... In in the no competition, you can be in there quite a while. My record is one hour. I'm just going to go to the next slide. Oh. <laughs> and the next slide. The parade onto court might be delayed. <laughs> you keep preempting me, Dan. Okay. <laughs> this is a really important one, and I'm just looking at time now, and perhaps slightly resenting giving you uh, extra time earlier on. But never mind. We'll, we'll 
soldier on. When you meet your athletes, meet your referee, they are going to check your name and introduce themselves. So they should be checking they've got the right athletes on the court with them. They're going to do the coin toss and the winner gets to choose if they want to play red or blue. You can ask to inspect your opponent's botcher balls before the coin toss or after the coin toss. It's up to you. Okay. The referee will ask how you communicate. If you communicate verbally, that's fine, but you might do something like, well, I put my hands up when I want my assistant to pass me the ball or I move my eyes to show them where I want them, what I want them to do with the ramp. And if you have a sports assistant, you also need to tell the referee how you communicate with them and what actions are part of your normal routines. This is really important. And actually from the point of view of having been a sports assistant in the past, it's something that a lot of um, our newer referees and actually some of our more experienced ones forget to ask. And when you're on court, if they think you're doing something that isn't part of the normal routine, they might intervene and stop the ball. So I think it's really important that the player and the sports assistant are, even if you're not asked how you communicate and what your normal routines are, you should tell them. So um, that would mean, for instance, um, Yes, I pick up the ball and I always roll it before I pass it to the player. That's part of the normal routine. So they're not going to ask me every time. I'm going to do it every time. It's part of the normal routine. Um, I'm always going to hold on to the chair or I'm always going to place the ball at exactly this position in, you know, on the, the wheelchair, the person, whatever else. Those are the things that you need to tell and from my experience, you need to be proactive about that. Don't wait to be asked. OK. The other thing I think it's really good to, to ask when you're in the call room in front of the referee is if you want your player, your opponent to move back when you play on the court. It's something that is done in courtesy and you'll see that players at high level, as soon as it's not their turn, they'll move to the back of their box out of the way of their opponent. But newer players often don't understand that or haven't been asked. And it's actually much harder for say a VC8 who doesn't have a wheelchair to move their chair back. But it's much, um, this is the time to say, when it's your turn, I will move back for you. Can I ask that when it's my turn, you move back for me? Otherwise, when you're on court, if you have to ask your opponent to do that every time, it's taking time out of your time as a player. So if you ask them straight away, they should do it automatically. And in fact, I have seen players who've taken a bit too long to do that and, and received a warning from the referee because they've taken too long. Um, unfortunately, sometimes not every player understands that very well. So the referee might also ask, do you need assistance to get onto court? So here we've got our friend Nigel Murray that some of you will, will know, um, being pushed out onto the court by the referee. So actually that's probably not the referee, it's probably a liner because the referee leads out the people on your court. And if we look further back in the picture, we can see Richard Evans carrying the jack ball. That means he's at the front of a group of players who are going to be behind him to go on the court where he's refereeing. And actually, um, it's probably the linesman or the timer that is pushing Nigel out onto court. And it's the, that's another court that's going out in front of them. So you could be in the call room for a long time if there's a delay on court. So it's not just 15 to 30 minutes, you could be in there for an hour or more. Um, and hopefully that won't happen. When you go out onto court, you follow your referee unless they're pushing you. Etiquette says, and I don't think you'll find this written down anywhere, that the red player or team always goes first. The players go out to their appropriate playing boxes. And if you've got reserves, they go to, go to the other end of the court. And then 
there's a couple of things that need to go to the other end of the court as well. So if you've, you've gone into, into the quorum with your red and blue balls, you've elected to play red. When you go out to court, you should take your blue balls to the end of court because obviously you shouldn't have more than your six colored balls and your jack when it's presented to you with you in your box. So you take the unused balls and if you've got something like a big communication aid that fits on your chair and needs to come off for you to play, that usually goes to the end of court as well. So the last thing we're going to sort of discuss is how do you want to behave and feel inside the quorum? Because there's lots of different sorts of um, behavior that occurs in the quorum, which I'm gonna show you on the next sort of three slides. Um, and then we're going to go into a bit of discussion to talk about how that might be at the sort of standard where you play at the moment. So Natalie, you probably realize I've just gone past one of our group sessions and pushing on towards the end because of the time. So do you want to be friendly or do you want to freeze your opponent out? I'm just going to pose that. So in this issue, one of these pandas wants to be friendly and is facing the other one. The other one's decided they just want some time to themselves. And both are completely acceptable behaviour within the call room. Do you want to face the wall or the room? If facing the wall helps you to focus and think about whatever you want to do, that's absolutely fine. Don't be offended if your opponent has done that. It just means they want to be in their own space and their own little bubble. Um, you might have earplugs. Do you want them in or out? You might have them just because you don't want to listen to anybody else in the call room, or you might have them because you um, want to listen to some music. Again, absolutely acceptable. How do you want to feel? Do you want to be chilled and just like really relaxed? Or do you need to get a bit psyched up, ready for competition and going into battle? Again, it's different for everybody. So these are some of the things that people do. Um, one of the nice things is that when you start to parade out onto court, people will often say good luck. So you might get, um, you know, the referees might stand and clap when you go out onto court, which is lovely. But you also might get people that, um, you know, if you've got different academies, somebody up might be going, oh, go on, Hawks, come on, Hawks, Hawks are great, go on, Hawks. And that's another Hawks player is shouting to you. Um, or if you've got England and Scotland in there, you might have England supporting all the English players and Scotland supporting all the Scottish players. And it can get quite loud and verbal. And of course, the worst thing is, if you're the only player from England and there's loads of Scottish players in there and they're all saying good luck to each other, you're feeling a bit unsupported. Just, just quite good to know that that could happen. So sometimes you'll get teammates that might be in uh, court number two, number four, number seven, and they all start chatting to each other around the call room. And um, it's a bit like, you know, they, they're having a laugh. Very often it's a bit of an in-joke. Nobody else really understands what they're talking about. And that maybe they're doing that to psych you out. Maybe they're doing that to psych themselves up. But it does happen. Do you want to listen to that? Do you want to get bothered by it? Or are you just going to ignore it? Well, your decision is down to what's best for you. So people might ignore you. They might put their headphones on. They might put their eyes down. They might turn their backs. You can choose to do that as well. Any of those things you can choose to do. And it really depends on what ready looks like for you. Because what you do in the call room and what you think about in the call room can affect how you feel when you go out to start your match. So if you want to feel cool, calm and collected when you go out to start your match, that might have an effect on how you want to feel in the call room or what you want to do and think. If you want to go out feeling like, you know, a prize fighter coming out for the world championships, then you're probably going to need to do something different and think about something different to get you out there ready for your match. So this is what I thought we would finish up with today, thinking about how your players might want to think and feel and what they might want to do in the call room. And I'm going to ask to go into sort of three different groups. Um, and I wonder if 
Uh, Bob and Andrine, would you mind helping out anybody that's a kind of a bit of a beginner, maybe somebody that hasn't been into a call room very often and hasn't known a lot about it, whether you're a coach or a player, um, and, and help them to think about that. Uh, Pete and Terry, I wondered if you'd be kind enough to help our intermediates. So Pete, people who might have perhaps had some call room experience, maybe as an athlete, but not as a coach, or been in a call room a bit, but not for a long time, want to think about it. I think we've lost um, Pete, just so you know, Sandra. Okay, so uh, I'm sure we can find somebody else to help Terry. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask Lauren and Dan if you might just go in with some of the, the, the experts. So our sort of top level players, people that have been in the call room an awful lot, so that because they might have a different view of how they want to feel and think in the call room. Um, so Natalie, how have, you, how have you set that up? I'm going to let people choose based, based on those kind of group leaders, um, if that's OK. I'm just yep. setting that up now. Um, Pete, uh, Terry, would you like me to pop in with you? Um, if you want, I'm happy to do whatever. OK, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> I've never been in a call room. No, so Carla, go in with the beginners group. So there's a newbies to so we've got a new to the call room group. We've got the done it a bit, but really want to you know think about it a bit more now. And then we've got if you like the experts group. You choose where you think you fit best. Carla, you would fit best in the beginners group. Which one's that? What's it going to oh, look like we, when it comes all right, up? On you, the you let us know. Right, okay, sorry. So um, I thought it'd be really good to maybe ask um, Bob and Andreen's group. I wonder what people were feeling that were in your group and how they thought they might manage and um, where they thought the call room would be quite daunting for them as new people. Go on, Andreen. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, we had a bit of a chat about that. And I think the conclusion was that really it's, it's all in the preparation, isn't it? And it's the opportunity to practice it and try it, whether you're the coach or the athlete, you know, somehow setting that up and simulating it in training or or trying it for the first time at a competition maybe you know I know Caroline was saying that maybe there's going to be some of that happening in Northern Ireland you know set it up in an environment that on an event that people are comfortable with and give it a go and don't put pressure on it that first few times so that then actually you can feel a bit more prepared and you you just then know what it's like. Oh, that's a really good point. So I delivered some quorum training at our academies um, when we were able to meet. Seems quite a long time ago now. And um, what we actually did is we did a little bit of training on um, you know, preparing for the quorum and how you organise yourself to get to the quorum with the right things at the right time. And then we would go straight into a break. And so something like a lunch break. So deliberately did the training just before lunch. And then at the end of the lunch o'clock was one o'clock. That was the time that the quorum door was going to close. So people actually during their lunch break had to organize themselves and get themselves ready to come back in. And if they didn't make it into the call room, which was just a corner of the room that we set up, then actually they did have to sit outside and listen to then the rest of the training about what happens when you're inside the call room. And hopefully that would mean that they would never, ever forget again, because, you know, I'd much rather they made a mistake when we're in a training environment than making a mistake like that when you're at an event. So and that's quite a good one to do, to, to do that bit of training before and then actually practice the call room straight afterwards. Thank you. Terry, you didn't have very many kind of intermediate people in your group. What were your discussions? I suppose ours really focused um we're sort of saying like it is very it's a very personal thing what players want to do but probably something we maybe need to do more as coaches is prepare people for how the other person might react and like we're saying there even uh at the likes of uk championships and stuff you have players that will sit and chat about the weather or their journey over equally you have players that'll sit with music in or just sit and not acknowledge you so and how players react to that is sort of yeah I think it's, it, it's really easy if you're not prepared for it, it's really easy to think people people are trying to psych you out because they're listening to music and they won't talk to you whereas actually it's not that at all they're just that's what helps them to prepare so um was there anything else that, that came out 
Um, no, I think that was sort of took up most of the time. Thank you. And Lauren, what about your group of people who maybe have experienced the call room quite a bit? Were there any other things that sort of came out that maybe I haven't covered or some other interesting points? Yeah, I think our group follows on quite nicely from what Terry was just saying. So we had a group of athletes who have also who also dabble in coaching, really. Um, so they, you know, quite a nice um, mix of experience as well. So um, they all said very similar things, but to have all of that come out, I think there's a lot of stuff that you can take from a coach's perspective to, to sort of learn from how other athletes will respond to that. So there was a lot of conversation about um, like having a chat with your opponent, um, using the time to sort of take some of the stress out of the situation. Um, the conversation about how it depends on what stage of the competition you're at. Sometimes you might be chatty, but when it gets to the later stage, stages of a competition, that might not be the case. So being aware about that for yourself and opponents, I guess, if we're going to flip it into a coaching sense, because we did just talk about what they sort of do in an athlete's sort of perspective. Um, but I think it's really good for people as coaches to understand what the athlete is going through. You yeah, know, definitely. Actually, that's one thing. We do have a lot of coaches who are former and, and current athletes, but actually we also have a lot of coaches who will never have the opportunity to sit on court and experience what our players experience. So, mm -hmm. you know, for actually for us to understand what, what's going on in, in their minds and everything else is really important. And um, Dan, I can see you want to contribute. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, there could well be mind games that other players are playing. And you've got to remember that thing about controlling what you can control you can't control what your opponent does but you can control how you react to it you can control what you're thinking and you're doing and so um dan i remember something you did on court really well as you used to just slice the battle box and, and almost reduce down inside and look downwards and that was kind of your off switch and i wonder if you did something similar when you were in the call room uh, um yeah, only one. Yeah, got to me. Sorry, Robinson. Where she is? Yeah, oh, 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 so I reckon you need to go and speak to your sports psychologist about that. <laughs> I mean, and this is this is another big thing. Actually, you know, very few players have access to sports psychology. But if you do, definitely talk to them about the call room and how you want to feel and behave and, and what you want to listen to in the call room. So that pretty much wraps up. We're going to go to another slide at the minute, which has just got the contact details on it so that you can find the rules and you can find the referee procedures manual that will help you. Um, and I think it would be really good. I've, I do note the time. So we're going to, I'm going to wrap this up very quickly. I think something that would be really useful to do is to spend two minutes before you go away, just making a note of anything that you think you'll do as a result of being on this um, Sort of workshop today is there anything that you think yes i want to do that it's very easy for us to go away and apparently celebrate st patrick's day apologies northern ireland <laughs> um but it's very easy to go away and forget so as actually right now if you want to write down a couple of things that would be great um uh, i will hang around if anybody wants to ask any questions or give any more feedback and jill i just i've just seen your feedback in there which looks lovely thank you very much and i shall have a good look through all the things that are in the chat um, a bit later um, i'm going to go to just sharing the last slide for you um so we go back to that you okay. might just need to reshare sandra yeah i'm just doing that now should see it now yeah, that's great. So um, 
take a few minutes to think down what you might do as a result of this. Um, as I say, we've got some, um, oh, what's the word? Links there for you to go into. Um, Natalie, I think you want to just have a word about uh, feedback from the course. Yeah, just before Sandra wraps up, just a quick message for me to say thank you to everybody for attending and thank you, of course, to Sandra for delivering. I'll I'll send a follow up message round with a copy of the slides for everybody. And as I said, we will get the recording up online at some point. Um, and there'll also be a little feedback survey in that email as well, which is really useful if people can take a few minutes to complete that because it helps us shape more of these sessions going forward as well. OK, thank you. So um, I'm going to hang around. If people want to have a chat now, that's fine. And I'll stay around to chat. People want to disappear. That's also fine. And thank you so much for joining us today. It's really lovely. And hope to see you at an event where there might be a call room in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.